never ever had any plans to be a quote solo artist unquote uh, and I, I to this point never think of myself as that um, Dio was a band of course that came out of a lot of frustration having been in some bands that uh, you know I'd been um, released from or um, Whatever the, the nice word is that makes us our egos feel a little bit better, but you know, booted out was you know what happens. It happens to everyone, and you either can deal with that or you can't deal with that. Uh, the first time it happened, mainly in the Rainbow Days, didn't make me immediately want to to get uh, you know to have my own band. But I did consider it, and in fact, I did work with a few musicians that were in Elf before. Once again, with Mickey Lee Sewell, with Mark Nassif, um, and. Uh, Craig Gruber, as a matter of fact, and uh, we were going to put a band together because there was an interim between Rainbow and the next band I was in, which was Black Sabbath. So when the Sabbath uh, invitation uh, came about, uh, which initially started only as Tony and I going to put a band together. It had nothing to do with Black Sabbath at all. Tony was going to leave the band. He wasn't happy with them at all. Uh, through a mutual friend, I was living in Connecticut at the time because that's where we went with Rainbow to live. That's where Richie wanted to live. So we, we moved from California back to the East Coast again. Uh, at that point, um, uh, I stayed there after my time in Rainbow was up because I really had nowhere else to go and didn't know what else to do. But it was a very difficult situation in New York. Uh, I wasn't really part of the New York City scene, didn't want to be part of that scene. And all the musicians that I knew who were playing the kind of music I wanted to play were back in Los Angeles. But we stayed there. And, and during that time, as I say, a mutual friend uh, who lived in California called and said that she had uh, talked to Tony Iommi at the Rainbow one night, a famous Rainbow Bar and Grill, and he wanted to know if he could get my telephone number. So she called me, and I said, yeah, sure. So Tony called, and he told me, as I mentioned to you, that he was, wanted to, he was going to leave the band and uh, form something else, and he knew I was not in Rainbow anymore, and he liked all, all the things that I'd done, and would I be interested in doing something with him? So we were actually started on, um, yeah, let's do that. Uh, he said, do you, have, do you have any musicians in mind? And I said, well, you know, I have a drummer. And he said, well, you know, I, I really want to use Bill because he had played with Bill all of his life, of course. And I said, that's fine with me. I said, you know, I said, there are other players. We can deal with it. Uh, so we talked for, for a while, uh, for a period of three or four months. And then uh, the conversation stopped because they were then at that point offered, uh, it was their, going to be their 10th uh, anniversary and they were going to do a big reunion tour. They had had a couple albums before that particular point that were not very successful. Um, so it was a very downtime for them. So, uh, as I say, everything stopped. Uh, money is a great deterrent for putting uh, musicians together. Eventually, I moved back to California again. And lo and behold, one night, uh, saw Tony in the Rainbow, who was a bit sheepish about it all and sent someone over to say, oh, do you think he'd maybe say hello to me? And so I did, of course, and... Uh, from there, I was invited to uh, to where they were rehearsing, and then the rest became what it became with Sabbath. Uh, so uh, I went into a situation where uh, leaving even was more hurtful than the first time. And after that, I think after both of those boots up, up the up the heiress, uh, that's when I decided that uh, I better take control of my own life. I think I know what I want. I think I've paid enough dues, and I, I this will give me a chance to choose the people that I want to play with and make the kind of music that I want to make without having any outside interference. So at that point, that's what happened. But it wasn't a, you know, it wasn't, you know, the this massive heap on my shoulders that said, do it yourself, boy, you can do it. Not at all. It took a while because I never had that solo attitude. And, and when I did put Dio together, it never was a solo project to me. It had my name on it, which I thought was clever from a business standpoint. After all, coming out of Sabbath, people knew who I was. Uh, and uh, Rainbow, and so what better connection for some kind of instant recognition than to call the band Dio? So, of course, everyone thought, well, Mr. Ego's done it again. He's called the band after himself because he controls everything and, you know, he just hires people and away he goes. But that's not what happened. Uh, at that point, that's when we started the search for the musicians to make the Holy Diver album what it was. No, Vinny was unceremoniously booted out with me. I guess Vinny mm. was tied to me in some ways. Uh, one, because he was my best friend in the band, probably. Two, because he was an American, perhaps. Uh, you know, I'm not claiming that there was that kind of, you know, uh, uh, ethnicity, that anti-ethnicity thing going on. It wasn't that at all. But because we were close, I think that uh, the camp became divided in some way. And they automatically assumed that, well, we've got to get rid of this guy. Well, let's get rid of the other one as well. Uh, and, and he just happened to be 
you know, unfortunately for him, or fortunately, I think I'd say more fortunately, he became part of, uh, of my journey away from Sabbath. Uh, I didn't have to beg him. I was happy as hell to have him. You know, I asked him if he would like to do it, and he said, yeah, let's do it. And, you know, that kind of support is, is really incredible. You need that kind of security when you go from being a part of a band and that, secure, that security umbrella is mostly there for you. And as soon as you're not in that, you, you know, you're, you're open to all the slings and arrows, and um, it, it just becomes a very hard thing psychologically sometimes to deal with. But if you've got some support there, and Vinny was that support for me, uh, he, and so he stayed, and we carried on from there. And that's when we started to look for a guitar player, actually. Um, not anything else but a guitar player. We tried a couple people here in Los Angeles, but uh, I, they just didn't suit. I mean, after having played with Tony and with Richie and, you know, heard the great ones, everything else paled in comparison to me. And I knew what I wanted. I knew the kind of player I wanted, and I really wanted an English player. I said, said that all the time anyway. I mean, I loved the way they played take chances, uh, th what they do on stage, or just the attitude of the, of the British musician, to me, is just so far superior to, to the American musician. Uh, certainly at that time. Uh, if we talk, you know, musician against musician, sure, there are some great American guitar players and great English guitar players as well, but I just always liked the attitude. Um, and I think that, you know, Britain, because it was, uh, you know, didn't birth rock and roll, always felt a little bit, I think maybe a little bit, not inferior, but we've got something to prove. And that's another attitude I liked. It was like no holes barred, you know, here's what we're going to give to you, and they did. So that's when we went looking for a guitar player. We did. We, uh, because, again, I, I, I was dissatisfied with what I found here. I didn't like the style of playing that, that, uh, that American guitar players were using at the time. They all wanted to be as fast as Eddie Van Halen, and that's not what I was looking for. I wanted someone who, if he had to be fast, could be fast, but had to have romance in his soul or uh, beauty in his playing, uh, you know, plus expertise and, you know, be able to write. He had not much to ask for, but, <laughs> you know, obviously those people are available. So we went to, to London uh, specifically to look for a guitar player. Uh, so Vinny and I went, and we spent uh, the first three or four days going around to clubs, you know, Marquis, uh, some of the other places in the West End, and uh, we ended up at one time at a, at a reggae show. We didn't even know who they were. We went in and and everybody was a Rasta, except us, and we went, nope, wrong place. Had a good pint in there, though. Um, completely wrong place for us, so we just couldn't find anyone, uh, no one who was good enough to, to, to fill our needs. So um, after about three days of being depressed, uh, I said, you know, I'm going to give Jimmy a call, Jimmy Bain, because, of course, Jimmy had played with me in Rainbow, and I thought, who better to know guitar players than Jimmy? So the call was only to ask him if he knew guitar players. So luckily, he had just come home after doing a show, some shows with uh, with Phil and uh, in a band they put together called the Greedy Bastards, and it was you know just a fun band. And Jimmy was playing keyboards in it. So he had just come home. He had three days away from um, the that particular tour that was going to begin again in three days and go to Scandinavia of some kind. So Jimmy came home, came right over to the hotel with two tapes. One was Viv Campbell, and one was uh, John Sykes, and. Although we, we liked, you know, John's playing was great as well. Uh, there was just something special about what Viv did. There were things that he played that were like off the beaten track, like he'd suddenly uh, put a little Chuck Berry movement in, and we went, wow, a thinking player. He thinks. He, he does other things. He doesn't just stay on the road. So we liked that very much about him. So uh, we had Jimmy call him. He was living in, in Ireland at the time. Had Jimmy call him, do you want to come down and have, have a play? And he said, yeah. So we got a rehearsal room at John Henry's, uh, got some gear off John, uh, and Jimmy came down too with his bass. You know, we, we didn't ask, but Jimmy came down. And my only trepidation would be that would Vinny be happy playing with Jimmy? Because at the end of the day, I could have said, well, Jimmy's going to be the bass player and you're going to wear it, Vinny. But that's not the way it works. If the bass player and the drummer aren't doing the job together, then what is the sense of even having a band? So... Okay, so Jimmy plugged in. Uh, I had written two songs. I'd written Holy Diver and Don't Talk to Strangers already. And we, I showed them both the songs. Uh, Vinny knew them because we had kind of rehearsed them ourselves here in, uh, at, our, at our home. And uh, we played them, and they were magic, magic. I said, wow, this is it. But let's give ourselves one more day. Okay, so we, we'll come back tomorrow. We came back, went back the next day, played a little bit more. And went, this is the one. Do you want to do it? And everyone went, yeah. Okay, fine. That was it. Bang. Done. Just like that. 
No, there wasn't at all. Um, you know, Los Angeles was uh, was my home and Vinny's home, uh, and certainly a whole lot less expensive to live in than London. Um, so it was easier to bring Jimmy and uh, and Viv here. Uh, Vivian had never been here, so he would be excited about it. Uh, Jimmy absolutely loved Los Angeles always, and uh, so it was no problem for Jimmy. So you know, we we brought the two of them over here. Then we started you know earnestly rehearsing and writing the songs, rest of the songs for Holy Diver. It, it, it was fast. I mean, it was it was only fast because we finally found the right players. The the lapse in time were, was probably the you know three or four months when we were trying out a few players here in Los Angeles, or when we were playing with ourselves. Because uh, when we first started, I brought the songs in. I played guitar. We just got an amp and cranked it up as loud as it would go, of course, so I could hide my mistakes. And we played Holy Diver and Don't Talk to Strangers, just Vinny and I. Uh, so we were prepared. But again, the important thing was that we found the right players. So introducing them to those songs was an easy thing, and they were so good at it, it was not a problem. Um, so it was only that lag time when needing to find those players, uh, it w would have even taken less time had they been living around the corner. But yeah, it, it was quite, quite immediate. I've never ever written a song when I've been in a band that, that I would not give to that band that I was in. I've never written anything that I saved and said, no, I'm going to use that one for my solo album. Because again, my attitude has never been to be a solo artist. It's only been to be one of the people in the band. Uh, that was my love. That's why I started to play music, because I, I, liked, I liked music, of course, but I liked the camaraderie. I mean, it's something that I'm going to miss most of anything when, when I'm not doing this anymore, and that's being on the road, and it's you against the world. So again, I never wanted to be a solo artist. Never, never in a million years. Um, and to this day, I still don't feel that way. So I never, never wrote any songs that weren't presented to and used by the band that I was in. I wrote them because I had to. I wrote them when Sabbath was over, and that's when I decided you better get off your, your ass, pal, and start doing it. So I wrote those two songs. No, 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 never had any of those kind of aspirations in the beginning, uh, and no formula for a concept for the album. It was only going to be what the musicians had to offer, and that's exactly what it became. When we started writing together, it was like we always used to do. Got any ideas? How about, here's a riff, I, oh, that's good, oh, let's work on that. And then we did it the way I've always done it, which is we don't start with one little, oh, that's a good riff, you got any more? Yeah, that's a good one, okay, let's jump from that one to that one. No, to me, it's a matter of you start a project, you finish it, then go on to the next one, and each song is a project for me, so that's what we did. Great riff, let's write that song, and we did. Makes you feel better about yourself, too, when you've got something in your pocket that always works, you know, that you know is going to work. Then you go on to the next one. So that became the formula for writing. Uh, but it, again, it was not a matter of uh, we need a song like this. What we did know was that when there was a song or a riff or something presented, we knew that it wasn't right for us, so we wouldn't do it. But we would choose the things that we knew would go in the right direction. Uh, lyrically, I just wrote, you know, what I wanted to write. Uh, again, was not uh, in any way shape or form beholden to anyone about what I wanted to say. No one could tell me what I wanted to say, and that, that was a joy for me. Uh, but I didn't want to go over the edge with it. But because I had been known for being much kind of more of that fantasy element in, in my writing, it certainly made a lot of sense for me to stay with that. Uh, let's now really go for this, what will be, that what became the concept. And th then we worked at it after that, I think. But the first one was just what it was. Visually, it was only a matter of, okay, we're going to go out on the road now. What should we do? Hey, let's build a big stage set and go for it. Okay. And we did. Um, you know, mortgage the house for that one, but that's what we wanted to do. Uh, it was important f I, for me to have this band put into a light that was going to be a bit more special than just another band, and I thought that band, this band deserved it. So that also came after the fact. The band developed and its visuals developed after the writing process went by, after we knew we had something concrete that, that was going to be really good. No, I wanted to do it myself, and not because of the control so much. It wasn't a matter of that. I think I felt that after all the years that I put in in the studio, and all the great people that I've worked with, the great engineers that I worked with, I learned so much from them. Well, from Martin Burtz especially. I, mean, I learned his methods, and I, uh, Roger Glover, who I worked with for so long, uh, I learned from these people, and I felt that I was prepared to do that. I mean, to me, 
production was not having to have, have my hands on the knob. That's the engineer's job. So I always felt if you've got a great engineer, then your ears will do the rest of it. And I felt that nobody's ears were going to be any better for the band called Dio than mine. Uh, so I did that, and not out of ego, but because, you know, I just felt that it was time for me to do that. And then after doing the first one, it worked, and I wasn't about to relinquish that hold until, of course, time goes by, and, and if, if you flag a little bit in your success from a record company always will come the well let's get so and so as a producer he did a great job for you know and whenever that did happen uh i did one project uh with uh, uh lock up the wolves uh, and uh strange highways with two producers two supposed to be producers who were i guess in their own way but it eventually ended up being my production because what happens is that when when these songs any song that we write we always pre-produce we always record them first and we always put in the parts that are needed if there's a keyboard part needed it's constructed it's put into that track it's put it in at the right place it's put in at the right level so when we present this in the studio to the engineer or to the so-called producer there's the song. All you've got to do, mate, is capture the sounds. That's all you got to do. It's arranged and, and just virtually produced, and it's been that way with every album we've done. So preparation has always been uh, a reason for not really having to have a producer to do it because he's only going to end up doing it my way anyway because I'm <laughs> going to say at the end of the day, no, I don't like that. It doesn't sound right. It doesn't sound like us. But, I, you know, I'm not that uh, stolid about it that I'm going to say, oh, no, you know, I mean, I'll listen, of course, but, you know, there are parameters that, that have to work for me and if they don't then if you go outside of that parameter then nope sorry so again easier for me to deal with um plus it's easier for the musicians a lot of times too i guess at times it might be harder maybe it's harder you know i mean being as uh, yeah we could ask him couldn't we um uh, you know being as as adamant as i am about what i want to hear maybe it is harder for them maybe they'd, they'd fly a little bit more if it if, it, if there was someone else giving them that freedom but you know until that until the band's name changes from Dio then it's not going to happen not the most amazing thing but the, a strange coincidence is that the very first track on this album stand up and shout was the last track written and that track was written only as the backing track um, at that particular point uh, Jimmy was going to um, Germany to do an album with Scorpions and so Jimmy left to do that and we we there was no time for him to stay around and listen to the backing track or to the to the vocal track because it hadn't been written yet because he had to go and Vivian left as well because he had done all of his parts as well uh, so they they both went away and uh, then I went into the studio and wrote the rest wrote the song the lyrically and melodically and uh, recorded it sent it to Viv and Jimmy and they went wow this is Great! Wow, brilliant! Well, good. I did my job then. So it was. That's the only song that was done a little bit more disjointedly than the others because they weren't there when I when I did it. And I always liked, and certainly in those days, to have Jimmy at the desk when I sang. When I went out into the studio, I mean, your producer's hat can is still on, but it's a bit tilted because you're doing some other job. You're not thinking in both those terms. I'm thinking now as a singer. So I would rely a lot on Jimmy. What was that like? Great, mate. Well, now nah, yeah, that other part was fine. So it was almost like having a, a little you know, assistant producer to do that for me. So uh, uh, in that particular case, Jimmy wasn't there. It didn't matter, you know, it did it anyway. But again, it was the track done, written last and put first on the album. Um, Holy Diver, as we've talked about before, I wrote myself. Uh, just felt that uh, a song of that kind was needed to really be the basis of what this album was going to be. Uh, I felt it uh, a song a little bit more grandiose, much like uh, Stargazer that we had done before, of course, with Rainbow or um, Heaven and Hell with Sabbath or, or whatever the tracks may be. Those were always, they, they are, were and still are the, the kind of songs that I really like. And I think it represents certainly the kind of lyrics that I've always written a bit better. I think they fit a little bit better inside of that, that scope. Um, so I wrote the song because I thought it would, much like having Vinny with me, it gave me some security. I had a song already there that I knew was going to work. So, you know, that song again presented to the band and they just did, you know, such wonderful things with anything that I wrote. They, they just made them all come alive and that really was their job. Um, so that was Holy Diver. Holy Diver, um, you know, we took a lot of chances in this album. We did, I, maybe not chances, what we actually did was, we did a lot of things that nobody else had done before because we didn't know any better. 
uh, drums, for example. We uh, put the drums with uh, Vinny's back to the, uh, to the uh, studio window, and we built around him, out of sheets, four by eight sheets of plywood, a room. And we mic'd the inside of that place that we captured for him, and that's why you hear this drum sound. And we did it on the second album as well, on Last in Line too, because it worked for us. Uh, it was so live, made the drums so alive, just like the rest of the tracks were. But that's one of the, the things that we did throughout this album. We set, had the drums set up that way. So we hardly ever saw Vinny. He was always boxed away somewhere. Uh, so, you know, that was Holy Diver. Um, uh, Gypsy, just wanted to do something that was, you know, uh, just a little bit more feelful, perhaps, a little bit more Stones-ish, perhaps, a little bit, I think maybe that was my, my thought, that it was sounded a little more like a Stones kind of song to me, and I wanted to do something like that, so that there would be this difference between the songs. After all, Holy Diver is now this big production, and, uh, you know, Gypsy's a little bit more shouted, and again, more, more feelful, feelful, so I wanted, wanted that particular song to be on this album as well. Uh, I'm trying to think if anything weird happened during the making of, of that particular track, but no, nothing did. Uh, we recorded all these, uh, this product at, a, at a, a studio called Sound City, which we had never used before. We actually rehearsed right across from the studio where they have the rehearsal halls. Uh, the, this was in the old days when the rehearsal halls were very, very small. They've since uh, done a really nice job of it, in there, but they were very small. And, we played very loudly, and it was uh, hurtful at some times. We'd have to have put uh, Angelo Arcuri was our, our engineer on uh, this album and uh, th four of the uh, the next three of the next ones, and um, he would go out with a little Tascam um, cassette four track recorder and try to get away from all the noise coming through the door so he could actually hear was what was what was going on. But in some you know weird way, we we made it all work. Uh, so anyway, back to Sound City put the guitars off in a room somewhere that nobody had ever found before, miles away. Uh, don't know why, but it made sense to us. Put another couple more, that's what I mean. We didn't know what we were doing. We uh, uh, put the bass off in a corner somewhere. Sounded good to us. Like I said, we made uh, a room for the drums. Pfft, sounded good to me. So we did what, what sounded best to us. Angelo, our engineer, had never en engineered a project, project like this before. Well, I had never produced one either. So here we were, two babes in the woods. And... Uh, Angelo just did a wonderful, wonderful job, um, and I think we were a really good team doing it. And Angelo, of course, was our live mixer as well, which is a job that uh, not many people take on. Uh, most engineers will be very worried about their ears, uh, but Angelo came from you know the same school as I did. Hey, live, let's do it. Eh, we can do it in the studio, no problem, but let's go out and do this live. So it, it was a nice, nice marriage, I think, between... Uh, uh, Angelo and myself and, and Angelo and the rest of the band because we were all very close. We became, again, this team that I had mentioned before. Uh, so that was Gypsy. Uh, Caught in the Middle was a song that I wrote actually about Angelo. Angelo's life always seemed to be that of, of one caught in the middle of some kind of turmoil. He would always make decisions that were wrong, and uh, he would always come to me and go, Ron, what am I going to do? I said, oh, what's happened, Angelo? Caught in the middle, are you? Yes. Oh, wow, what a great title that is. That became Caught in the Middle, and the song was actually written about Angelo. <laughs> um, uh, Don't Talk to Strangers, again, that was the second song that I, I had written on my own before finding the band that we were going to use. Uh, wanted something, you know, up-tempo. Um, it, it just became, that song just became a product of my guitar playing. I mean, that's what it was. You know, not the world's greatest guitar player, but... Um, I think a lot of the things that I've written, um, riffs and songs that I've written on my own, have been more acceptable because I play like every man. I don't play like uh, Richie. I don't play like Tony. I don't play like Craig. I don't play like all these you know guitar players that know how to do it. So what I play, um, anybody can pick up and do, and that's always appealed to me. I mean, because I think that's music is for the masses. I don't want to be Joe Satriani. You know, I, I'm, all I want to do is write a good song, but I think that because my method is that of everyone, that I, I think it, it made all things a lot more approachable. Uh, so the next song on the album, uh, Straight Through the Heart, uh, there are some of these songs on this album that, that I think reflect my own trauma at the time as well. I mean, as a writer, I think you're always going to draw upon what's happened to you. I mean, I, uh, either good or bad experiences, that's where it comes from. And... During the making of this album, you know, I, I had some personal things that were going on that were that bothered me quite a bit, and I think a lot. Some of the songs that are on this album, you know, reflect that. Uh, one of them being "Straight Through the Heart." 
uh, and the song itself, you know, is here it comes again, straight through the heart, you know, and there's no worse pain on the face of the planet when you're in love with someone or, or th that kind of a thing. So, I mean, I just use that as an example of, you know, something, you know, very hurtful. Uh, so, but I think, you know, again, they, re they reflect some of my feelings uh, at the time. Invisible, I, I just love the idea of, of, of what we were going to do to the song. Um, I, I thought it was a clever title. Uh, it was written about uh, three different people, uh, a gay man, a gay young, young man, um, uh, an abused girl, and me. Uh, there's a triumvirate for you. Uh, anyway, uh, I, and I wanted to write these songs from the standpoint of the person of someone who had been injured more, you know, psych psychologically and trauma that way, uh, and that happened in the case of the of the the young girl, uh, in the the gay boy. They were always being uh, put upon and kicked and shoved around for not being what people expect them to be, um, and then included myself in the last part of it, only because you know I've spent all my life on a stage, and a lot of trauma involved and a lot of that stuff too. I thought I deserved to be in that. Uh, because of what most musicians have had to go through in their lives. But the whole answer to it was, you know, you can just become invisible. You can escape those kind of things because you have a mind that will let you do that. And I don't mean escape them forever, but, you know, when people do that to you, why do you want to stand there and have the arrows and the stones being thrown at you? Hey, I'll just become invisible. you never see me. So I, I really, really liked what the attitude of the song was. Uh, again, played really well just really, really well. Everything on this album was played so well by the by Jimmy and Viv and, uh, and uh, Vin. Any keyboard parts that were there, Jimmy and I did, and you know, we were very simple players as well, and that's another reason why it worked. But that was invisible. Um, we have uh, Rainbow in the Dark. Uh, you know, it's a song that I really disliked. And when it was finished, I announced to everyone that I was going to take a razor blade and just cut the tape up. And so I went for the razor blade and I went, no, no, don't, don't, don't. I said, well, I don't like it. It's too poppy for me. To me, for me, it was too poppy for this album. I didn't want to create a piece of pop because it came from a different space. It came from Black Sabbath already. You know, a band that allowed me to do anything that I wanted to, as dark as I wanted to do it. Uh, so I didn't want those people who had liked what I'd done in Black Sabbath to say, oh, here he goes, now he's changed, hasn't he? Now he's become a pop, pop artist. I didn't want that to happen. And to me, because of, and, and only because the rest of the songs weren't quite as poppy as that. This one really stood out as being a, a, a pop kind of thing. And the riff was poppy, and the, the little keyboardy thing was poppy. But at the end of the day, it worked. So they talked me out of it, and I didn't do that. And I thank them over and over and over again for doing it, which doesn't mean that it's my favorite song still. I mean, I still will always have that feeling of that song, that it was too poppy for me. Luckily, the bands that have played that song now have all gotten the idea that it needs to be a lot heavier. So it is. So it works. But again, I'm very glad that they, they talked me out of that. But I, I disliked it so much that I really wanted to destroy the, the thing. Uh, and I believe that in the beginning, that song, that was, uh, that was Viv's riff, and uh, that uh, it was originally called by Viv, I think it was called A Bottle of Wine. Uh, well, at least we got a better title out of it than, than that. Uh, but that was Rainbow in the Dark. Um, and the, the last song, Shame on the Night, I think, again, is probably a reflection of how I felt at the time. Nighttime is the worst time on earth to, to have problems. Everything during the day seems like it, you know, life is going to be okay. But as soon as it gets dark and dreary and the oppression falls on your shoulders, you start thinking too much. There's not, not much you can do at 4 o'clock in the morning but think four o'clock in the afternoon, I can go out for a ride or take a walk or whatever, but four o'clock in the morning, I don't think most people should be out at that time, usually get in trouble doing that. Uh, so, you know, I think I equated the night at that time with, you know, having bad dreams and bad things going on. Uh, and it was, again, I thought a clever title, uh, personalizing the night and saying shame on you. Um, and, you know, riff-wise, it worked as well. So, I mean, so much of this works. Uh, I mean, if I'm not giving enough credit to the other people in the band, you know, please forgive me because this was a total package that we put together. This was four of us and not Ronnie. Uh, whatever accolades I've gotten from it are probably because I've carried on with this band and because I have, have a long history of doing things. But they were so, they did such a great job. Um, you know, I never want to diminish anything that... Uh, either Viv, Viv, Jimmy, or Vinny did on this. So uh, if I'm talking in terms of only myself, it's only because I'm 
I'm the one who's talking, and I don't mean to. So, you know, kudos to them forever and ever. Uh, and that was, so that was the last track. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a joy to make. The album was a joy to make. I learned so much, not only about recording, but I learned so much about myself. I learned a little, to be a little bit more patient, to deal with people a little bit better than I had before. Um, I think now I've, I'm falling back into the other trap, and I'm, I'm worse to people now. But, you know, that happens when you get a bit, a bit older and, and set in your way, more set in your ways. But, again, it was a great learning experience for me, and it was uh, so fulfilling, especially the fact that that album was a, a success right off the bat. And we had a record company, it was Warner Brothers, uh, who uh, um, not until a month into the making, the making of this album even knew anything about it, I guess, uh, or at least... Um, no one, no one whispered it to them, I guess. So about a month into making the album, well, it was going very well, and we had already written Rainbow in the Dark uh, with the razor blade thread, of course. Uh, we had contact from our, from our record company, and uh, they said, uh, so you're, you're making an album? Yes, uh, it's per our deal, because what had happened was I, they had signed me to a solo deal when I was in Sabbath. We were signed to Warner Brothers, and Warner Brothers said, we don't want to lose this kid. So... We want to sign you to a solo deal. So they and uh, Polydor, or Phonogram at the time, both signed me to a solo career. So when my time was up in Sabbath, I had an album deal all ready to go, which was, you know, wonderful for me. So we started the project, and then we were called in my Warner Brothers and said, uh, we need to uh, have a meeting with you. And I had a meeting with uh, Ted Templeman. Ted was head of A&R. And uh, the meeting was at 10 o'clock in the morning. We didn't get out of the studio until about 4 o'clock in the morning, so I... Wendy and I went uh, to Warner Brothers and dragged ourselves in, got there at 10 o'clock and waited about a half an hour in Ted's office. He came staggering through the door and he went, what are you doing here so early, Ronnie? I said, well, I, you're the one who called the meeting. He said, no, I didn't. He said, what's this all about? I said, well, I'm assuming it's about the fact that we're doing an album and you don't seem to know about it. I said, so what's the story? He said, who's producing it? I said, I am. He said, get out of here and go finish it. So we did. So we went, and then we started getting some visits from people from the company who come down and want to hear what was going on down here. So we played them a couple tracks, and one of them, of course, happened to be Rainbow in the Dark, and that was the end for them. They went, that's, wow, these are our boys. And even with that, uh, you know, the, what they liked about it, uh, at the end of the day when it was released, they still weren't, you know, uh, touting it as one of their greatest products to be released, and you must hear this. It really was like Heaven and Hell album uh, in that, People made it successful. Uh, people, uh, some bands would play it during their breaks, um, uh, or after their show. People coming in and out, and people go, "What's that?" And it became such a word of mouth thing. The same way Heaven and Hell did. People would hear it at a show. Bands would hear the album and go, "Wow, what a great band!" They would turn other people onto it, and suddenly it became this instant hit uh, that just stunned the record company apparently. And uh, then they started working a bit harder, uh, but. It, that really is the story of that album from its beginning until its, its success. And its success was, as I said before, certainly you know, mostly due to the people who played on it and then secondarily, of course, to the great, great fans who supported me all these years and the ones who were, who were turned on to this band and this album and made Dio what it's become. Well, we, we wanted a, uh, an album cover that was going to be just what it turned out to be, which was uh, uh, fantasy on the fantasy side, but with a little bit of reality chucked in, which was, uh, uh, to most people's eyes, a monster drowning a priest, a priest in chains, uh, which was going to be a little bit controversial, of course. Uh, well, good. But I wanted to do that because I wanted people, I wanted it to be controversial so I could explain to them what this was all about. And when they would say, why do you have a monster killing a priest? I could always say, how do you know it's not a priest killing a monster? And, you know, in the day and age that we live in, I think my, uh, my thoughts were correct. Um, so, you know, and the whole purpose of all that imagery and being able to say that was because I wanted to say to people, do not judge this book by its cover. Don't judge anyone's life by what you see. You judge them by what's inside of them. It's the heart and the soul and the spirit that counts, not what you see. So don't make those kind of hasty judgments because that's always been my philosophy. So there's my philosophy on the cover of this album, perhaps. Um, and it was... Uh, you know, it, it was an album cover that uh, most parents wouldn't let their kids put up as a poster, uh, which I guess worked pretty well. 
You know, because kids want to be rebellious, and they, they, as soon as the parents say no, there you go. But we didn't do it for that reason. But it became an offshoot of that kind of artwork that parents were very fearful of what kind of uh, evil was going to befall their children if they looked at that poster.